So what does a local conversation do? Um, this is not an official answer. This is how I've come to think about it. Um, <clears throat> I think of a local conversation as fanning the strong town's movement to life in their community. Um, there's nothing more powerful than an, than an idea whose time has come. And we are more and more convinced every single day that the Strong Towns movement is an, an idea whose time has come. When Chuck comes back from being on the road at a speaking event, he will say very often in the Slack channels to the rest of the staff, I wish you could be on the road with me. I wish you could feel the excitement. Uh, we, I don't know the exact numbers, but every week we're in the event coordination meeting. And I mean, we're probably turning down, like reluctantly turning down six event requests for every one that we can say yes to. Uh, there's just so much excitement right now. And so what I see local conversations doing is finding and connecting the different sparks in their community, adding some oxygen to it and coaxing it to life. Because one of the things that we have discovered as Strong Town staff and what we try to communicate again and again to the Strong Town's audience is that you are not alone. You're not alone in your community. This is one of the biggest fears and challenges that people have when they think about starting a, a local conversation, and I'll get to that. But I guarantee, I can absolutely guarantee you that you, unless you live in a town of one, uh, which is, doesn't seem possible, like you are not alone, and I'll explain why. So specifically, what are some things that local conversations uh, do? So they're getting together, they're meeting, they're, they're, uh, they're talking with one another. Uh, and then they begin to take action. We have found that it is especially powerful when, when groups are meeting together in person. Um, it's great to have an online presence. In fact, that can be really, really useful, but there's something really powerful when groups are getting together, meeting in person. There are groups that uh, uh, some local conversations have working groups, uh, and then they also have like social hangouts. Uh, and so a lot of them will do kind of a combination of those. They meet every other week, uh, usually uh, some of them meet monthly. Uh, these groups are getting together. They're learning and educating with one another. They're learning together. They're going through Strong Towns courses. They're going through books, Strong Towns books, or Jeff Be Jeff Specs, you know, the new version of Walkable City. Um, they're they're going through video series. They're also teaching. They're sharing videos and articles with people in their community. They're giving talks and speeches. They are giving neighborhood walking tours. Um, Charlotte Urbanists. Uh, I wrote about. Uh, their group for our, our member drive in November, one of the ways that they're educating their community is they, they do public policy power hours, kind of on the street level, where they're talking about uh, strong towns related issues on the street where people can kind of see around them how these uh, issues are really playing out in real life. Uh, they're hosting documentary screenings. This is a, a picture from Burlington, Vermont. I just wrote an article for them that I think will be published next week. They hosted uh, a documentary where they had 90 people come from throughout the community. This is actually their like the public launch of their group, and they did it in conjunction with a documentary screening about street safety, and they collaborated with other groups to get the word out, and 90 people came. So uh, then you have folks like... Um, like Mason Thompson, who is a city councilor from Bothell and is now the mayor. So local conversations are getting members elected to local office. They're fighting infrastructure projects like highway expansions and unnecessary bridges. Uh, they're conducting do-it-yourself value per acre analyses. They're hosting Q&A sessions with city office candidates. Uh, they're writing op-eds and letters to the editor. Oh, yeah, that's here's an example from the Baltimore Strong Towns group. They've written multiple letters to the editor that have been published in the Baltimore Sun, and then they've actually been contacted by the city to thank them for that letter, like to to uh, for the their positive advocacy work on behalf of Baltimore. They're undertaking tactical urbanism projects. For example, they're converting excess parking spaces into parklets. They are doing traffic calming. Uh, here's a, a picture from also from the Charlotte Urbanists, where they're installing bus, uh, installing benches at bus stops to bring dignity to to transit users and a little bit of comfort. Um, they're helping to bring in Strong Towns events. Uh, we have uh, a group in Balt in uh, excuse me in Santa Barbara that is working to make permanent the pedestrian only slow streets that people fell in love with during the pandemic. 
They're beautifying their cities with street trees and public art. They're speaking up at city council meetings, meeting with city officials. They're nominating crashes for our crash analysis studio. Like I, the, the list goes on and on and on. No group is doing all of these things. No group should try to do all of these things. It's all dependent on who's in the group, what their talents and interests are, uh, what the group wants to focus on together, um, and how it uh, and how much time they have. Something else I should mention is some many groups work together on projects, and that is really ideal. But some groups, when they're first getting started, help the individual members on the projects that they're already working on in their community. One example of that is the Strong Towns Portland group that I also wrote about in November. So they're doing so, so much. 